Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Book Doctors NaNoWriMo Pitchapalooza. I should have said annual in there, but here we are. Here we are. Hello, all you Rimos out there. We, we have such a fondness for National Novel Writing Month. And um, we just enjoy doing this so much with a bunch of really dedicated and passionate writers. And we've had so much success. So many of yeah. the people have participated yeah. in the NaNoWriMo Pitchpalooza now have books book out. Deals. And not just yeah. one book for some of these authors, but multi multiple books. So it's particularly exciting and satisfying to see that happen. We're proud. Um, and if you go to the original post um, on our website or on NaNoWriMo's website, you can check out what the winner's books are. Yes, Winner's Pass, The Ghost of Winner's Pass. Exactly. Okay, few pieces of business before we get to hear the pitches. Um, so this webcast is part of NaNoWriMo's I wrote a novel. Now, now what? what? And uh, mo those months. And uh, the link will appear in the comments. And if you're watching um, a recording, it'll be in the notes. Okay. So we encourage you to keep uh, up with Camp NaNoWriMo, which yeah. happens in April. It's a fantastic resource for editing, finishing the book, getting it all polished up so it's ready to go out into the marketplace. Exactly. If you have to leave at any point or you know someone else who wants to watch this, this is gonna be available yeah. until YouTube dies. In perpetuity. Yeah. And to view, you use the same URL as you're yeah. using right now. And um, you can visit our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash the book doctor. Make sure you subscribe, okay? And you can subscribe. subscribe to our channel where we have lots like and, share. and lots. Like and share. Lots and lots of other videos oh, to yes. help you get yes. successfully published. Yes. yes. So uh, on the right, let's see, that's my right. Uh, stage right, there is a box which will have comments in it. Um, it's for chatting with other participants uh, and um, asking us questions. So please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Now, the one thing about the chat box is that does not get archived, unlike the, right. the um, workshop itself. So the Pitchapalooza. So if there are URLs that people post or information, make sure to write it down because it's not going to be there after this is done. Well, copy and paste. No one writes. Who writes things down? Can you copy and paste? I'll bet, I'll bet there's a few people are there with somebody a journal who writes while things they're down? they're watching this. Fair enough. If you have any problems at all, please contact the brains behind the operation, Christy at the book doctors. K R I S T I at thebookdoctors.com, who is our CTO. Is she? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, She's also our CAO. She's the chief awesome operator. Officer. Officer. Operator. <laughs> I, really, I don't really even know what that is. <laughs> Well, I wanted to say she's awesome. That's all. Okay. Uh, so, um, oh, if it freezes up, refresh. Yeah. And you can share tips online using the NaNoWriMo oh. hashtag, and oh. you can tag us at the Book Doctors yeah. if you're on Twitter. Okay. Um, okay. So here's how this whole thing works. So we had uh, over ten thousand uh, pitches that came in. No, that's, it was 100, that's, that's a hundred thousand. We had one million. David likes to exaggerate, but we did have hundreds, yeah. just shy of six hundred people pitches. sent their pitches in. Yeah. And there were some amazing pitches. So we, mainly her, read every single one of them, all these pitches. I read a few of them, but she read every word of every pitch. And so, then we randomly, from there, just picked 20 out of the hat. But we think it's important to read them all because you all put so much effort into this yeah. that it doesn't just go into some kind of blind black right. box that someone is on the other side reading your work. And we want you to know that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and by the way, if anybody out there wants us to come to your hometown and do a live pitch of at your local independent bookstore or library or wherever, please let us know, uh, send us a comment or an email, or go to our website because we love to travel. We've been to all over this country and found fantastic writers and helped them get book deals at the far flung ends of this country. Yep. 
In fact, a NaNoWriMo Pitchapalooza participant is the reason that we got to have two weeks in Alaska, Alaska. in <laughs> rural Alaska going to library. So, so amazing. Yeah. amazing librarian, yes. Amy Marshall. Shout out. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Let's yeah. get to All this right. already. So we're gonna read these 20 pitches. We're gonna read the 20 pitches. We're going to deconstruct them in a kind and gentle way. Yep. And then at the end, we are going to pick a winner. And that winner will get an introduction to an agent or editor who is appropriate for the winner's book. Yes. And we're also going to have a fan favorite. Yeah. So if there's one pitch that you absolutely love, you, you are crazy about, vote for it. And how do they vote? What is going to happen is Christy is going to post on our website all the pitches at the very end of the Pitch Palooza. You can go right from here to there and click on your favorite pitch. Now, in the past, we had a couple people say, we don't think fan favorite is fair right. because so much of it is just getting your friends to click on it. Right. And here's why we think this is so important. Guess what it's like when your book comes out. You want to get your you got to get your friends click on it. to click on it. So this is training <laughs> is. for that, as well as you know, people getting love for great pitches. Yes, but so, you got to be able to mobilize your army. Yeah, and that's what publishers are counting on in this uh, modern era of books in which we live. With that, eh bien, allons-y. You want to read that's the French. first one? I'm going to go first. Here we go, and they're off, ladies and gentlemen. And the Floods Came Up by Angie Romanez. I think I'm pronouncing that right. A fearsome flood is about to bear down on Cutler County, and no one sees it coming. No one except 17-year-old Cheyenne. She can feel the waters rising in her bones. Life in eastern Kentucky has been unkind to Cheyenne. Her boyfriend comes home from his shift at the coal mine drunk and angry as sin. Her only friend is ditching her hometown and the middle-aged Bible camp clown she married in high school. Her daddy's been gone since before she had memories and her drug addict mama went missing months ago. But Cheyenne's mother did her one favor before she disappeared. She warned Cheyenne to get the hell out of Cutler County before the gift mm. took hold. Her mama knew better than anyone that place with its kudzu covered mountains and ancient indigenous bloodlines amalgamating, could drag a person to the bottom and never release them. Told from multiple points of view and the floods came up, blends the subtle setting based magical realism of Alice Hoffman's Red Garden with the quote unquote hillbilly gothic style of Don Pollock and the gritty braided narratives of Laura McHugh's The Weight of Blood. I have an MFA in creative writing from the Ohio State University, where I also teach English to wide-eyed <laughs> freshmen. What else are there but wide-eyed freshmen? <laughs> Excerpts from And the Blood Came Up have been published. And the floods. What did I say? Blood. Blood. Oh, my God. And the floods came up, have been published, or are forthcoming in the Bangalore Review, Silver Pen, and Bookends Review. Other works of mine have been published in Blinders Literary Journal, The Bind, 1888 Center, and elsewhere. Great. Awesome pitch. Fantastic really, pitch. Really, really good. I mean, there is so much, so much in here. Yeah. Um, we get a real sense of setup of yeah. what the stakes are for this character, what she's up against. We, we the have this setting. setting, a great place. Yeah. And brilliant comp. Titles. Yeah, the comp titles, so that alone. Comp stands for comparable. comparison, comparable, comp, either one. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and then that's a great, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the comparison titles and how they're very important and how you shouldn't use the biggest names in the world, how you should show your deep knowledge of where your book is going to sit in the bookstore. And this is a fantastic deep dive into what this book is similar to. Readers of these three books are going to love this book. It's very clear. And then Angie establishes her authority yes. to write this by showing us that she's, first of all, has an MFA in creative writing. Right. She's teaching English. 
and she's had work published in in journals and she's and not good just, journals. Yeah, absolutely. And she's not just at any Ohio State University. She's at the <laughs> Ohio State University. And also the character Cheyenne. Yeah. I feel like if Cheyenne walked in, I go, oh my God, there's Cheyenne. She's awesome. I mean, I feel like I know her after reading this pitch. Right. And one of the most important things you can do in the pitch for a story like this uh, is we have to fall in love with the main character. So what's interesting is she may not be the main character. Right, but that's told how it's from presented. from multiple points, points of, of view. view. So here's um, my, my critique of the pitch is that that came as a surprise to me. Me too. Because I was focused on Cheyenne. Now, it's a difficult thing, novels with multiple points of view for pitch purpose. Yes, it is. Because you, you only get to have a little bit of each person. But I think we need to at least know who these uh, other points of view are. A cast of, our cast of characters include Colin. Her boyfriend. Right. Maybe her friend. I, I, something to give us a sense of that. Um, and also, the pitch really is just set up right. without right. giving us a sense of arc. And so right. as great as all the setting stuff is, I think we need, and the character, we need something that's going to give us a sense of where this is moving to. Yeah, where the plot, and it doesn't really lead to a f to what's going to be a fiery climax where it looks like the character cannot possibly succeed against seemingly insurmountable odds. All right. But very well done. Terrific job. All right. Number two, The Cyber Trials by Heather Ryder. Give a man a mask and he will show you his true self. Mm. Oscar, Oscar Wilde. Wild. It's been two months since Alicia Farrell's body was found dumped in the woods and Elaine Thompson isn't sure the town of Patriot, Indiana will ever recover. Grief has given in to anger as the FBI task force tracking the Midwest Strangler remains empty handed and the case grows cold. Then Elaine gets a call from her best friend's lawyer. Tristan has just become the primary suspect in the investigation and Elaine is his only alibi. Except none of that makes sense. Tristan lives in Texas, and he and Elaine have never physically met. Brought together in their early teens by a love of online video games, Elaine and Tristan have spent the last 15 years sharing their lives virtually. Now they have to convince the world of their friendship, or Elaine's testimony won't hold weight. But as the trial unfolds and the evidence against him, against him starts to stack up, Elaine begins to question everything she thought she knew. Caught between an overzealous prosecution desperate for a conviction, a town out for blood, and her loyalty to Tristan, Elaine struggles to separate fact from fiction. The state says she was either willingly blind or naive, but Elaine's can't but Elaine can't believe the story is that black and white. To reach the truth, she must dig into painful memories she has long since hidden away. But what she finds may shatter their friendship forever. Dun, dun, dun. Another excellent pitch. It really is, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I love the way uh, these people have this relationship that's over the internet for 15 yeah. years. So it, very au courant. Yes, it is. And very current also. Um, so I feel like, um, again, I, I got a real grasp on who this main character is. And this one, I thought you did sort of get was, the sense of where the plot say. is going. In really here. good arc. Really and, nice. And the twist. Yeah. We're getting the plot twist of when she starts to question whether this guy is That's innocent right. or guilty. So you reveal, I feel like, just enough without revealing too much, we go, oh, I get that. Now, I really don't know what's gonna happen next, and I want to find out, and that is yep. a major, you know, that's what you're going for, the pitch. Now, how do we make this better? So one thing that I think in terms of making it better is actually to go back to pitch number one, which is that um, uh, the this, I don't know where it fits on the shelf. Is yeah, it a thriller? Right, right, right. Is it a What's mystery? mystery? Right. Is it um, literary? Right. Is it not literary? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And comparison titles would go a long way Help to enormous. helping us figure that out. Yeah. So that's that's one thing. Um, and 
Yeah. I ahead. also didn't quite get. I mean, is she? Does she love the guy? Is she in love with them? Are they having a romantic thing? And and the consequences are he's going to possibly go to jail. As I, I, I'm unclear as, as to how much of a, of a romance their relationship is and how much they're friends. Mm. So I haven't really quite uh, sort of bought into their friendship and why it's so vitally important to her that she would go through all this for him. Yep. Okay, picture number three. The Prince of Little Palestine by Mo Shalabi. Adam Husseini is going home. Ten years ago, his fundamentalist father found him with another man and nearly killed him, sending him fleeing the Virginia suburb of Little Palestine, where he was raised. Now, following the news of his father's death, Adam returns to reclaim his inheritance and possibly even his place in the tumultuous and traditional Palestinian-American community. But his father's will comes with a catch. To inherit his fortune, he must not only marry a woman, mm -hmm. but one of his uncle Sarah's choosing. Adam finds himself broke, helpless, and defeated. But when he begins to unravel the truth, which materializes in the form of letters, photographs, and tales sent to him by a mysterious figure, he uncovers a conspiracy spearheaded by his very own uncle. Something sinister is brewing in little Palestine, and someone is trying to warn him of an impending doom that could tear the community apart. With the help of his cousin Farah and the clues he acquires, Adam discovers that he is at the center of a rebellion simmering amid little Palestine for years, with the Husseini family and without. Uncle Salah, the catalyst who is driving this rebellion, wants an Islamic awakening that threatens the nearby Jewish neighborhood so as so as to distract his people, including his nephew, from fulfilling his plan to become the new ruler of Little Palestine. Only Adam can stop him, but Uncle Salah is hiding a dangerous secret, and it could destroy Adam. What happened? Oh my God. <laughs> now, it has a bunch of credentials. Should we, isn't that, should no. we read them? What? There's credentials here. Nope. Because it's over the word yeah, limit. It seems like it's uh, yeah. over, the, over the word limit. Yeah. Okay. Again, comparable titles would be great. Yeah, but let me just start by saying oh, it's, that really feels like a book yeah, of does. right at this In moment. moment. It does. I agree. And I agree. it has great plot twists and yeah. turns. And you lay so much pipe that <laughs> makes us what, say, what's going to happen? What's the secret? What's this thing? And also just the the um the when at the beginning when he talks about that the will says not only does he have to marry yeah. a woman yeah, yeah. but it has to be of his uncle's right. choosing right. it's such a great setup it really is so i i i was really engaged yeah there's so much opportunity by, for comedy for yeah pathos there there was while well, you talk and it's a real uh you know dive into a culture yeah. that's fascinating to many people um and you know we're we're friends with Khaled Hosseini, who um, you know has, has written uh, is a cousin of this book and had great success with it. Um, so I, I like the voice in the book also. Yeah. So uh, the, it seems genuine and real and interesting. The um, the one thing when you said a rebellion is simmering amid little Palestine for years, that was the one part where I sort of kind of lost the center of the, our character. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what you meant. Like, is there, is the leader of the community, you know, what, who, what does that mean to be the leader of this community? And what does the rebellion mean? I felt like we needed a tiny bit more specificity there. Um, but I, I think in general, this had a true arc yeah, and a great sense of character, and the the uncle. Um, there's there's a great line from Middlemarch where she says, "Until domestic reality met them in the shape of uncles and turned them back from their great resolve." And there's this history of uncles, uncles in man. literature who have ruined Beware people's uncles. lives. Beware the so, uncle. There you go. Uh, I I think a little uh, um, come some comparable titles would be very helpful. Yeah. As well. yeah. Okay. Next pitch. All the Stars Are Gone by Anna Downs. 
When aspiring actress Emily finds herself auditioning for the role of a piece of cheese, she realizes how much her life sucks. She's jobless, penniless, essentially homeless, and a massive disappointment to her adoptive parents. Oh, and she's a magnet for sexual harassment. In short, things couldn't get worse. Enter Scott Denny, a multimillionaire who seems to offer all the answers to Emily's problems. But Scott has his own problems, much darker and more terrible than Emily can imagine. When Emily accepts a job working at Scott's remote estate in France, she finds herself living at close quarters with Scott, his wife, and their six-year-old daughter. As her relationship with each family member grows and her feelings towards them become more complicated, Emily falls down a rabbit hole of wealth and extravagance and cuts ties with her former life. But soon she has questions. Why do the Dennys live such an isolated life? What is the mysterious illness from which Scott's daughter is suffering? And what has Scott done that makes him drink and cry and harm himself? Emily is about to uncover a devastating secret, and soon she must make a choice. Will she destroy her own happiness to protect the people she has come to love? That's it. So, uh, again, a very interesting story. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Leanne Moriarty all, meets the light between oceans. All the stars are gone is Leanne Moriarty's Meets the Light Between Oceans, a literary commercial fiction novel mm -hmm. of 85,000 words. The story is based on my experiences working as a housekeeper on a French estate in 2009 and 2010. Okay. okay. Well, that's good. That's that's I want that Excellent. There. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that it does present some problems. Let's get to that after All we right. say what's awesome what's about working. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, I myself uh, played a, a piece of cheese in my acting career, <laughs> uh, and I'm still getting checks for I got a check for 43 cents the other day for, yeah. for my work as a piece Might of cheese. Might have been for two cents. No, this was the 43 oh, cents. Oh, okay. Yeah. The two cents or something else. So, I, I mean, I just related to it. I think a lot of people will. Um, and this idea of being penniless and, and um, abject and everything's going wrong, and all of a sudden, it seems like, ah, great. I get to live in this opulence with all these amazing things and these cool people, only it's not. So it's, it's got a lot of um, tropes of classic stories, but it's, it's got its own twist in it, um, which is, you know, people are looking for things that are familiar and yet unique. And I believe this this has that. And it has a clear uh, a hero that we, yeah. we follow. So there's a couple lines. Oh, and she's a magnet for sexual harassment. That comes out of nowhere and isn't followed up on in the pitch. So I would lose that line altogether unless it's a major theme and that it needs yeah, to play out. Yeah, you either need out. to expand it or eliminate it, but it doesn't yeah. seem to go anywhere within this. And I don't think you need to say enter. I would just say Scott Denny, a multi-millionaire, seems to offer all the answers to Emily's problems. Um, so uh, We're always trying to make the pitch as tight and concise yeah, as we possibly yeah. can. Um, but I think, the, the, again, we see the structure yeah. of a plot yes, here. Yes, we do. And I, I think that's really excellent. So um, the thing that David was going to mention at the beginning there are certain things in pitches that display someone's lack of knowledge of the publishing business. And there's one in here that everyone should pay close attention to because many of you did many it. Many people do. A literary commercial fiction novel. Fiction novel. It's the same thing as saying a literary commercial novel novel. Yes, or fiction fiction. Or fiction fiction. Right. <laughs> so this is a literary slash commercial novel. Or you could say uh, an, an upmarket novel is another way of putting that. Things are usually either literary or commercial. That's sort of a distinction that people make in general. And upmarket fiction basically S says, says it. Literary fiction is a teeny, 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 right. tiny slice yes. of the publishing puzzle. So upmarket basically says this is something that book clubs can read yes. and the sentences are good but it's not pure poetry. It's like the prestige uh, television of yes, books. exactly. And I think that would be a better way to go. Yeah, I agree. Alrighty. Getting my posture together. Nice. How do I look? Mm. Okay, The Cost of Silence by Claire Vetterlaus-Bird. 
open quote. Moments like this define who we be who you become, the full weight of Alan's unwanted body on top of me, my vocal cords paralyzed with fear. Every mood of his move of his body pushed me closer to a vow of silence. No one would believe me. A star football player raping a nobody sounds so far from the truth. How could I convince the police, my mom or friends? As I lie mute and numb on the ground, I decide the only solution would be to take things into my own hands. This would never happen to anyone else. Tonight would be the beginning of the end, not for me, but for Alan, end quote. Recovering from the scariest night of her life, Charlotte spends the next few months of her junior year playing golf, binging Gilmore Girls and plotting a foolproof plan to murder her rapist. Everything seems to be falling into place until her younger sister starts dating Alan. Charlotte knows Alan is a ticking time bomb and she's racing against the clock before he hurts the person closest to her. Will she choose to protect her or follow through with her plan? The Cost of Silence is a cautionary tale of remaining silent, where boundaries of right and wrong are tested and bounds of sisterly love are forged. Where is it? Bounds. Bonds of sisterly love are formed and broken. Shame and fear are now the catalyst in Charlotte's life. How long can Alan keep her silent? The YA contemporary. This. this <laughs> that one you really didn't need to go in. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. My apologies. This YA contemporary fiction novel. Here we go again. Discusses society's biggest secret, rape, and its repercussions. Wow, we're getting books we really that are, are so like timely, timely. Man, right? Ripped from the the uh, uh, headlines. Exactly, um, and and the the um, the pull quote at the beginning from the book I thought was excellent. We really get a sense, yeah, the voice of, of the voice and all of that. And, and the stakes. The stakes are huge, yeah. and you put her. Uh, there's a not. There's a wonderful novelist, Caroline Levitt, that right. we highly recommend all of her books. And she's a writing teacher as well. And she says the best place you can put your protagonist is between two horrible choices. It's the Sophie's Choice syndrome. Exactly, and you've done that. Yes. So you've absolutely. So you have the fiction novel issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so YA contemporary fiction is is great, um, and and um, I think you have a I think the cost of silence is a terrific. Yeah, title. I really like that uh, title. And it, again, it seems so you know me me too movement. Uh, it just it plays in perfectly with this. Um, I, I guess I, I don't really um, quite see the ending didn't quite congeal for me in my head. I didn't quite understand. There's something I'm confused about. I'm what's confused. What's happening at the end here. I'm wondering if you're confused about the same thing. It says she is racing against the clock before. Will she choose to protect her or follow through with her plan? How is it? Aren't those the, the same, same thing? thing? Because if she goes through her plan and kills the rapist, that means her sister's going to be saved. Right. So that That's, conundrum is, I, I had a pause yeah, there. I did too. So I agree. Um, but I think this is really close to. I, I do too. I mean, you being fix ready that to and, yeah. send out in the world. Uh, and I think, you know, this there's a, the publisher somewhere waiting for this book. Yeah. Okay. Um, next pitch Nitsa and the Chupacabra by Hannah Carmona Diaz. The monster of Nitz's nightmares is on the loose, but outrunning it may not be an option. After dad returns home from Iraq, 11-year-old army brat Nitza is forced to go on a daddy-daughter RV trip to rebond with her father. What they don't know is that a ghostly woman in white has sent Chupacabra on an ancient secret mission. Yet when strange events such as dead goats, frightening howls, and a missing child occur, Nitza begins to suspect that the blood-sucking beast may be on their path. If her suspicions are correct, all hope of bonding with dad may be lost, as they will become Chupacabra's next meal. Nitza and the Chupacabra is a completed 37,000-word middle-grade spooky contemporary. Told from the duo point of view of both the monster and Nitza, it is the first in a planned series. As a Hispanic American and army brat, th this 
this, this, um, this own voices manuscript combines Hispanic folklore with a present day setting. Comparable titles include Summer of the Mariposas by Guadalupe Garcia McCall and The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. I am the author of Beautiful, Wonderful, Strong Little Me, a freak publishing, a member of SCBWI and owner of Collective Art School of Tennessee. When I'm not writing, I'm vlogging on my YouTube channel or posting way too many gifts on Twitter. Great. So, a ghost story. Who, everybody loves a ghost story. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, 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 I also thought the idea of um, the girl and the army dad yeah, having nice. to be trapped in this RV together to bond. I mean, it sounds like an 11 year old's nightmare in one way, but I, I would have liked to seen a little bit more of that relationship played out because the start of this pitch promises that we're gonna see a relationship between an army brat kid and her potentially messed up dad. And that doesn't really come to fruition at all. The other thing that's interesting, oh, I, first of all, I love that you're using um, folk tales. Yes, in, I think that's me great. Um, and um, I thought the way you presented your bio was excellent yeah. and really gave confidence that you can write this. The surprise for me here was that this was told from a duo point of view of both the monster and Nietzsche. Because we don't get any of that. We don't get pitch. any of the monster. Yeah. So we need to know what's the monster's problem. Right. Two, what's the monster up against? Does the monster have uh, been put in some kind of monster hell with its mother that it has to bond with? Or what, what, what are we, why are these two stories bumping up against each other? I think that would be really helpful yeah, in the and, pitch. And there's a little problem here that the story itself takes one small paragraph, but the, the um, explanation and your bio is actually longer than the, the, the plot and the pitch yeah. for this book. I need to know more about this. And, and oftentimes when you just do a laundry list, there are dead goats, there's frightening howls and a missing child. Those things don't send a chill through me because they're part of the laundry list. I haven't seen you yet create a scene that sends chills going down my spine uh, where you, you're actually presenting something that scares us within this pitch. And I think that's a, that's a yeah. little bit of a problem. I also think dead goats in that list is the only one that stuck with me because the others are sort of generic. Like they're not, child, though, right. Yes, Whereas owls. dead goats, I immediately saw dead goats and when you I, said that. I don't really know what a chupacabra is. Do you? I don't. And but I think it need, I need, may, need to I'm know I'm assuming that. that it's the monster. I know, but what kind of monster yeah, does what it look kind? like? What right. is it, how is it different? It's than, a cool word, I'll it's tell a you that. Word. But but with everybody, when you're presenting something like this that we, we don't quite know, how is it different and how is it similar to all the other cool monsters we've seen in a million different books with monsters in them? Yep. Okay. The Bronze Mirror by Melissa Benight. Ryu wasn't expecting to find an old bronze mirror when she fell in the well. When he, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Ryu wasn't expecting to find an old bronze mirror when he fell in the well. <laughs> and, he clear, and he clearly wasn't expecting to find a cursed old bronze mirror. Now he's a demon with horns, fangs, red skin, and a red-hot temper to match. And it's only thanks to the sacred jewel given to him by a Buddhist priest that Ryu is able to appear human and resume his normal life. If you can call fighting demons in your free time normal. As Ryu learns to live with his curse, he finds himself facing off against a variety of creatures he had thought existed only in folk tales, including cucumber-loving kappa, fierce tengu, and beguiling snow women. Their master, Ka'an, is after the mirror, and the Buddhist priest who, who has taken Ryu under his wing believes that Ka'an wants it for nefarious reasons. But when Ryu discovers Ka'an's true identity and purpose, he wonders what side he really belongs on, and if his curse will ever be broken. The Bronze Mirror is a 46,000 word middle grade fantasy heavily influenced by Japanese folklore and religion. 
I lived in Japan for four years, originally hailing from Idaho. My husband and I moved to Nagoya, Japan, three years ago. Prior to living in Nagoya, we lived in the rural prefecture of Shimane, an area famous for being the place of origins of many Japanese gods and monsters. So another folklore story. Yeah. Cool, right. I, I love it. And this. for those of you writing middle grade folklore stories, Rick Riordan has started Riordan. his Riordan, sorry, is starring his own oh, imprint. imprint. He has started his own yes, imprint yes, he has. where he's looking for yeah. stories based on for folklore kids. from other cultures. So yeah, just a little tip there. Yeah. 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 So the interesting thing is I recognize before getting to the part where you tell us that this is uh, Japanese, based on Japanese folklore, I, you know, there are certain words I recognize, like cucumber loving kappa uh, and tengu, but I didn't get enough of a sense of place right, or time right, 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 um, right. to understand um, exactly what, what the world building was here, though we definitely have a character that. Um, you know, you have a good setup for this character and the chase that's going to come after him as a result of this mirror. So I thought all of that was was well done. Um, but I, because this is so much about Japan, I wanted a little bit more, especially in the beginning, like even in the first line, to give us some sense of, of you know, where he is. Um, I think would be really helpful. And the bronze mirror as a title, as opposed to the book that came before Nietzsche and the Chupacabra, where we get the um, we we get a Spanish yeah, word yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah. The bronze mirror doesn't give away anything about the Japanese nature of the book. So that's something to think about. Yeah, it is because you you want people who are interested in Japanese culture to be drawn to this book, uh, obviously. Um, I, I thought um, also. Uh, there was a part where it says uh, Khan wants it for nefarious reasons. Mm. That's so vague. I don't even know what that means. What is he plan? What are the consequences? What are the stakes? What is he? What What does nef What are the nefarious reasons? What is he going to do with this potentially? What's the What's the worst case scenario? That's sort of what we always want to know in these stories. If everything goes very poorly, what's gonna What's gonna happen to our our main characters and to this story? I love that he's this hideous demon, but because of this jewel, he's able to appear human. I thought that was a wonderful detail of the pitch. Um, and that was something that I was really able to visualize. I guess I also wanted to know when he is the demon. I mean, does he want to kill people too? I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure how this demonic part of him played out. I know he mm -hmm. chases uh, other demons, but... I mean, it wasn't clear uh, exactly how how his demonicness played out for him as as a, as a human. Yeah. Okay. Audrina's Moments by H. M. Shander. Audrina may, may be a witch to her coworkers, but at home she's somebody's hero. Since her mother's death a few months back, she's become her 22-year-old brother's legal guardian. Michael suffers from muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy. And while her home suited her, it's not for someone with disabilities. With his comfort in mind, she sets out to hire the perfect person to make the required changes. Chad is the well-researched carpenter for hire. Rugged yet endearing, he agrees to rebuild the deck on one condition, that Audrina help. As the renovations get underway, Chad charms Audrina by having Michael assist slowly winning her over by treating Michael like a real person. She relishes in these moments with Chad and, and finds her hardened heart softening. As many magical moments as Audrina shares with Chad, beyond the renovations, she knows it'll never work out. Her heart and energy belong to Michael and his well-being. And despite what Chad thinks is best for her, there's really no time for frolicking. The more he pushes her to live a little, the harder she fights against him. When Michael's health rapidly declines, she shuts out everyone, Chad included. However, it forces her to see the depth of her loneliness. Maybe Chad really was the perfect person to make the changes in her. Is it too late to tell him or did she push him away forever? Sorry, there might be. There could be more. There could be more. Yes, yes. 
Andrina's Moments is a 67,000 word contemporary romance. romance novel set in my hometown of Edmonton, Alberta. Sorry, I didn't know what the AB stood for. So yeah, I was going through this pitch and I'm thinking, well, it's like what the, the phrase, uh, he's a uh, rugged yet endearing. I'm like, ooh, that's, that sounds um, a little bit like I've heard that before. And then when I see it's a romance novel, I'm like, ah, it's yeah. perfect. We want someone who's rugged yet endearing. So uh, it's it's funny how you know what the genre of your book dictates your language, your plot, your characters. And once I saw this was, a, I thought it was. I was hoping it was a romance because when it wasn't, like, ah, perfect, okay. Um, I I thought it was really a fun story, and um, we have a friend who writes romances with people who are dis differently abled. Yes, but but she writes them where they are the romantic interest. I'm just saying. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yes. It's a cousin of that yes. book. Kate Forrest. Kate Look Forrest, her up. You should. I mean it's <laughs> it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Um so yeah, I thought these characters were really interesting. Great sense of arc. Great um it 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 reminds me of one of the subplots in Love Actually. Oh with um yes the uh, uh laura linney yes yeah exactly. has to look after her crazy brother and has a yes. super hot dude who keeps kissing her right and right like, and it's such i mean it's, it's such a great part of the movie it is. and people love it they do i i think you know this genre yes yeah, so i think like you that. constructed it perfectly if you're not a member of the romance writers right. of america yeah, yeah. rwa please join yeah. when you get off this um this webinar I'm sure because, they have a Canadian situation. Of course they do because it's going to help you find an agent or publisher to be a member of that. And the only thing that I wasn't wild about in the pitch is your title. It no, just yeah. doesn't it sort of lays there a little bit, right? Moments. Moments right. just sounds like we're gonna get some snapshots of something, right. not a whole story. Right. Right. So I, that that was the thing to me that stood out. Um, and and also with romance in general, comp titles are super important. Yeah, are. So people know what how time. commercial, yeah. where you sit in terms of you know the ver the the different kinds are. Is this like classic Harlequin? Is it more that you say contemporary? So we know that it's it's not that. But having comp titles will help us figure it out. There's two things that I think could be better. One is the setting of Edmonton. It's cool. I didn't get any of that in the pitch. And the other is I felt like Chad should have some kind of problem. It just seems too perfect now. Maybe it's just me. All right, is it me? Am I up? Yes, I am, right? Yes, you are. Where Are You Really From? By Samantha May Koyutu. Koyuto, if I'm getting that right. After her first semester in USC, Chloe takes the dreaded 12-hour flight back home to the Philippines for winter break. She gets the shock of her life when her Instagram-loving dad suddenly invites her boyfriend to her cousin's wedding. To clarify, this is the boyfriend her dad hates because he's Filipino, and to her dad, Chinese people only date other Chinese people. But Chloe can't celebrate her dad's change of heart because she and her boyfriend broke up <laughs> months ago. <laughs> Thanks to her meddling auntie's offer to match make Chloe, she goes on five dates with five different Chinese boys. The only problem is that they're all arranged by her dad without her consent. In other words, everything is freaking awkward. <laughs> Aside from battles in her love life, Chloe struggles with fighting for her dream to become an animator. When she draws, she feels like she can make art that actually matters. She keeps trying to make her dad understand that all he wants is for her to take over his denim manufacturing business. The more she spends time back in Manila, the more she feels torn between her life in America and her past life in the Philippines. It doesn't help him that she unexpectedly starts to fall for an aspiring dentist that her, Love it. Said, that her dad set her up with. The big question is, is going for her dreams worth leaving behind her family? Where Are You Really From is a contemporary YA novel based on my life as an Americanized Chinese Filipina. We're getting so, so many cool like cross-cultural books Love from it. So the, interesting One places. of our NaNoWriMo Pitchapalooza winners is Gloria Chow, yeah. who has a book out uh, this month called American Panda. Panda. 
and it's about being the daughter of Chinese immigrants who want to set her right. up <laughs> and she not being that interested. So if you haven't checked out that book, you really should. It is fabulous yeah. and it has such a great voice. I, I there's so many fun things yeah, about really this are. and the voice is so great and the humor yeah. and everything and and it it just screams movie it does. to me absolutely um, yeah. because yeah. of all it it has a sort of threes company in the best sense right uh, that might be too old and reference it might be well, <laughs> Ang Lee did one of his first movies oh, about right. uh, this could be an Ang Lee yes, movie yes yeah. totally um so I think that the I have a point of confusion, which is I love the first paragraph that her dad invites the boyfriend that he hates, but they broke up months ago. But then all of a sudden, we're thanks to her aunt's meddling. So what happened? Did the boyfriend come to the wedding yeah, or it's not? Sort of like it never goes anywhere. So that gets dropped. It's a great paragraph, right. but I don't understand it. Right, and it doesn't uh, uh, come to any sort of fruition. There's no fruit there. Right. Um, the other thing is, this is contemporary YA, but she's a college student. Um, she is 18, and and actually, Gloria Chow is another example of this, where her books put, takes place in the first semester at MIT. However, her character goes there a year yes, early younger, because she right. skipped a grade. So this kind of gets into new adult territory, which is harder to sell. So you might want to think about putting her in her senior year of high school instead of her first year in college, although I guess she would have been home. But anyway, just something to think about yeah, there. I don't really think that was a problem, but people are so finicky about their what's YA, what's new adult. You know, they have all these rules about how old the characters can be. Um, I didn't quite, it took me a second to, to differentiate the Filipino and the Chinese. Like, like that, that, that did you have a problem with that? No, no you don't have a problem with that. No. Uh, so her people only want her to date Chinese people. Because her, her parents are of Chinese heritage living, living in the in Philippines. Philippines. Yeah, right, right. And so they're still very much gotcha. in the Chinese community, not yeah. interested in mixing. Yeah, that was that that gave me pause. I didn't quite get that one. I, okay. through, but you, I you totally got it. Um the the other thing is I don't think you need the last line of the pitch. I think it can end with it doesn't help that she unexpectedly starts to fall for an aspiring dentist that her dad has set her up with. It's such a great line, and the last line is a throwaway. Yeah, but I think it needs some sort of conclusion after that. I do. Well, I do. I do. So I do. Um, I also feel <laughs> so like you could. <laughs> so you can take our advice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I feel like there maybe could be a little more. Uh, uh, um, world building for where we are in this uh, thing. Like, you know, what are they eating? What are the what, how does it, it must be a culture shock going from USC. Yeah, I actually to, think David's for people who are not aware of the insularity of the Chinese community in other places right. in the Chinese diaspora, 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 yeah, yeah. Yes, um, yeah. that you might want to differentiate between Filipino and Chinese communities in the Philippines in some subtle way. Yeah, just a little thing there. And just a couple of little word pictures uh, of, of this world, because I don't know why I can't see this world in my mind at all from this pitch. And I know it's got to be interesting. Okay. All right, here we go. South Bay Beat by Joyce Krieg. The summer of 1960. The Soviets and Ike are playing a high stakes game of brinksmanship over the U-2 spy plane incident. Kennedy and Nixon are going mano a mano for the US presidency. And the defense industry is rapidly paving over paradise in the South Bay, the region that one day would be famed the world over as Silicon Valley. Enter the world of South Bay Beat, a 90,000 word historical thriller. Del Verhalden is a scrappy young reporter, hungry for a career-making story. When local authorities are all too eager to cover up the death of a young woman found on the muddy shores of the bay, he teams up with a beatnik disc jockey and an annoyingly nosy 10-year-old to expose the truth. The case threatens to topple the aerospace industry that brought the first generation of tech geeks to the South Bay and sends fingers of suspicion far beyond the valley as the threat of nuclear annihilation hangs over the planet. Based on real people, places, and top secret projects, as well as information in previously classified documents, South Bay Beat sends readers back in time to the dark side of the Camelot era. 
Think Mad Men with a Murder, and offers perspective on how the, this obscure farming community transformed itself into the high-tech capital of the world. I'm a traditionally published author with three mysteries from, from St. Martin's Minotaur. South Bay Beat is built upon my own experiences growing up during the dawning days of Silicon Valley. Cool story, a really interesting place, an interesting setting. Uh, you know, we all know, so we live in the Bay Area, so we, yeah. we know that part of the world very well. And, you know, we think of it as a certain thing. But I love that you're taking us back in time as it was going from being a farming community to being the aerospace capital of the world. Uh, and and it's, it's a cool story. It's a really cool story. So a few things. I think it has to start with Del there Halden is a scrappy young reporter. Yeah. The stuff at the beginning it just it, it doesn't feel like a novel. It feels like a history right, book. Right, right. Um, those those historical details could be woven in. Some into of them the story. could be woven yes, in, yes. like the fact that this is the area that's going to become famed as Silicon Valley. I'm not quite sure that we need the Kennedy and Nixon are going mano a mano. Like it's, it's, um, it, it might be too much for the pitch to, to go there. I think we can have that there's, that, you know, there's a um, high stakes game of brinksmanship um, that, that the Soviets are doing that, are doing that what you want to talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, no, I've, I want you to be done. Okay, your, I'm okay. done. Uh, I feel like there's not enough of the actual machinations of this plot. Yes. I mean, I, I don't. I'm, it's I don't, a thriller. Where's the thrill? Where's the thrill? I'm not getting the thrill. Um, and and you know, Dell with all these stories, the main character has to have a problem. They have two problems. One is obviously the the external problem where they have to solve this murder but the other one is an internal problem what's wrong with them what did they don't what don't they have that they desperately want that they're going to either get or not get or they're going to change their desire in some way throughout the course of this story and i don't see that at all um and i don't see the great danger that they're going that he's this guy's going to go through um as he gets closer to solving the murder you know i don't get that that moment where oh my god he's going to get thrown off the cliff or whatever terrible thing is going to happen to him. And I think Mad Men is not a good cop. Mad Men isn't a thriller. You're well, just using that to say it takes place in the 60s. Right. But I think you should, it, it, it doesn't, that's an episodic drama about an advertising agency. Like I, it, I don't see the comp in that except for the time. I, there's so many books that take place in the 60s. Right. So I, I think there's a better comp to offer there. Um, and uh, the bio is excellent. Yeah. Clearly showing you know how to write a mystery. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess the question is, is this a mystery or is it a thriller? That, that also comes up. Yeah. I mean, we've got a dead body. But we don't see who the, who the, the killer that's, is, so it seems like a mystery. To me. It, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't see the chase. I see the dead body. Right. So yeah. that's another question, yeah. but fascinating yeah, it is. time yeah. subject, yeah. really cool. Yeah. Did I read that? Yeah. I think you did, didn't you? I don't know. I can't remember who read what at this I point. I don't know. Watching Wilhelmina by Mary Jo Talbot. Wilhelmina O'Meara lives for science class, rock guitar riffs, and spying on the boy that sits across from her in first period. But when Wilhelmina is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, her overprotective mother insists on homeschooling her. Wilhelmina tries convincing her mother to let her go to school while secretly praying for a cure. When neither happens, Wilhelmina's only hope for going to school may be a discipline-challenged dog named Daisy who has an innate ability to alert when Wilhelmina's blood sugar drops or rises if her mother agrees. However, Wilhelmina isn't keen on taking Daisy to school because she wants to keep her diabetes a secret and having a dog at school would be like wearing a flashing sign. But it's her only hope until the principal says Daisy must be a trained service dog to be allowed in school. With her family short on funds, Wilhelmina takes on training Daisy over the summer with the help of her twin brother while desperately bargaining with God for another option. Training Daisy proves to be a challenge with, and with no other alternatives, Wilhelmina must decide if attending school is worth exposing her secret. 
Watching Wilhelmina is a middle grade fiction novel, a fiction novel that explores the clash of living with a chronic disease and the desire to live a normal life based on my experiences mm. as a diabetes educator and school nurse. I am the recipient of a McClatchy Newspaper President's Award and a SC Press Association Award for science writing. Any book with a service dog, I am yeah, going right, to right, suffer right, for. Right, right, no, and I haven't seen one in a no, kid's I, book. I, I so I, I'm cool. so excited about this. And yeah. I love the fact that you are a diabetes educator and school nurse. That, yeah. that just is fantastic. I love the idea for the story. Yeah. I am confused at a number of points, though I think you've constructed an interesting plot. I love the character also. Yeah. That she lives for science class, yeah. rock guitar riffs, and spying on the Yeah. It just seems like a story that, is this, is this middle grade? Yeah. Yeah, that our, our middle grade uh, kid would love. Something like so this. this is what I'm confused by. It says, uh, when neither happens, Wilhelmina's only hope for going to school may be a disciplined challenge dog named Daisy, who has an innate ability to alert when Wilhelmina's blood sugar drops or rises, if her mother's mother agrees. Her mother has to agree on the, with the, the dog or the so sugar rising. That I'm confused about. Well, it's just a poorly constructed sentence. Um, she, so... Wilhelmina isn't keen on taking Daisy to school because she wants to keep her di diabetes a secret. But it's her only hope. Her only hope, what? For going back to school and not being homeschooled anymore. Until right. the principal says, Daisy. She's homeschooled. She doesn't right. want to be homeschooled. She has a crush on the boy. She right. wants to go to school, and this is her only hope. Okay, but it's her only hope until the principal says, Daisy must be trained. Wilma's trip. Well, desperately. I see. So she's desperately bargaining with God for another option, meaning she still doesn't want to take Daisy to school. So she's trying to come up with something else while she trains her. I think that's what they're saying. But I felt confused when I read it. I didn't feel that confused. Okay. I just thought it wasn't clear sometimes the writing itself. Okay. Um, I, I think it's a great plot I structure. It's a fantastic uh, story. I love it. Yeah, I do too. Um, I, I I think it needs a little bit more of a of a fiery climax at the end. I think we need a little bit more about the dog, actually, and some yeah. little things about yeah. like what she does, like you know, when she says "sit," instead she runs to get her her favorite yeah, Kong something, right, or right. or something like that. Um, I thought it was weird that she dropped a twin brother in. Right. Mm. At the end, and if we don't get anything else about him, it's sort of like, what? So what you could do there is you could say, but when Melomina is diagnosed with type 1 diet, her overprotector mother insists on homeschooling her while her twin brother still gets to go to school or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, that's good. Or like if that. he's forced to be homeschooled, that can be in there too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but this is terrific. It is. It is. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Alliance by Tara Leem. Liam, Leo can remember a time when his world was a little more accepting. Now he knows that he'll be shot if he admits who he's in love yeah, with. That's good. As the intergalactic alliances that have held strong all his life fall apart, Leo knows that he needs to do something drastic. Will fighting a war bring the galaxies back together, or will it push them either, even farther apart? And as the ammunition rains on base 211, Leo understands that the war for the galaxy isn't the only thing he's fighting for. He is fighting for the right to love who he loves. There are only a few things that could shake up Leo's world past what's already happened. And he's been playing the waiting game for too long. He needs to take his future into his own hands and change the track of history. He needs to show the galaxies that being gay is not the same as being a failure. Note, I am only 12 years old. That's from there, not from here. She's more yes. than 12 years old. 12 year olds, come on, that's Woo! fantastic. When I think of what I was doing at 12 years old, I'm embarrassed, I'm humiliated. This kid's writing this amazing stuff here. And it has such a great twist at the end that he's, he's gay. Um, and you, and you, get a, you get a hint of it yeah, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's I didn't, I didn't, it's still. He is fighting for the right to love who he loves, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're getting little hints of it. Yeah. 
but but you do such a great job yeah, really, of, yeah. of ke keeping us wondering yes until what is, who does he love yeah. blah 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 so i think i think that is you have a great story here on your hands it's it's really terrific so the thing for me is in any kind of sci-fi or fantasy pitch we we want this thing called world building so we know what world you are right exist your characters yes. are existing in and we have a lot of galaxies but we don't know what is unique right. about these galaxies how they're different from our current life on earth or, right or now different from other science fiction uh, stories that we've seen um, exactly so that is the part of this pitch that is missing for me right now even though the story is very clear yeah i mean and, and, and some of this some of this could come to life a little bit more as ammunition rains on base 211 i don't really feel like i'm there with the bombs falling and things exploding and um i think you could paint that picture better to make it come to life more because for everybody your pitch is your audition to show us what a beautiful writer you are and to be your ability to create a scene that moves me that makes me unsettled or makes me laugh or cry or makes me scared that there's ammunition raining down on our hero. But I just want to tell you that this is a better pitch than so many of the adult pitches that we get by professional writers. Yes, yeah, and that's not an exaggeration. So You're awesome. You're awesome. And 12. <laughs> All right. Jihadi Bride by Alistair Luft. Eric Peterson is a rising star on the High Risk Traveler Task Force, an organization that prevents radicalized individuals from joining extremist groups. Disciplined and dedicated, cracks appear in Eric's carefully controlled world when his daughter, Ariel, ah, her name? Ah, spelled her, the same way. When his daughter, Ariel, leaves university to join the Islamic Caliphate, a brutal terrorist regime in Syria. Eric rallies a desperate effort to stop her, but when he fails and is subsequently removed from the task force in a bid, bid to compartmentalize the investigation, he resolves to bring her back, whatever the cost. Driven by a secret she can't outrun, Ariel's dream of a more purposeful life is confronted with the brutal reality of life in the caliphate. When she attracts the attention of Abu Nur al Khanadi a converted American soldier bent on punishing his birth country for its actions in the Middle East, Ariel must choose whether to sacrifice her ideals to survive or risk a frantic bid to escape. Torn between rival agendas, father and daughter must choose between family or country, love or fear. I currently serve as a Lieutenant Colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces and have spent the majority of the past 12 years in counterterrorism. Jihadi Bride is my second novel and it will appeal to fans of Ausma Zayanat Khan's Asa Hatak series, and also to those who enjoy an isolated incident by Sonia Kamal, the literary equivalent of Taken meets the terrorist. Jihadi Bride delves into family relationships, extremism, and a search for meaningfulness that spans societal and geopolitical borders. This is really, I love Very the cool. title. I think it's a great yeah. title. It's a very good title. It's and a really good title. your bio, yeah, it's very impressive. Is yeah perfect it is for this perfect. kind of thing really because for, from the point of view of media, yeah. of the publicity and marketing, the fact that you are a lieutenant colonel who has spent your life dealing with counterterrorism is just it's it's just made I can for just see you on the view. Yeah, right. And you're the kind of person that. Um, a professional photograph in uniform yeah, would, be very would be very helpful totally. to you. Yes. Um, and and you know this is one of the parts of of becoming a successful salesperson for yeah. your work. Sometimes, I mean, we want a pitch to be as great as it can possibly be, but sometimes it's some of the things that surround the pitch that can be just as important, yeah. like a photograph. Absolutely. So this is a very interesting. Um, uh, situation of of a a man who is fighting against a particular group only to have his daughter join the group. yeah i really like so that. it's a it's classic really, yeah. um it, it it kind of reminds me of uh philip ross american pastoral yeah, a little bit swede yeah, yeah with yeah, the swede yeah, totally. um so 
I think it's a really great setup. Um, so Ariel, I don't know how much of a character she is, but life in the caliphate to me would be one of the most interesting parts of this book. What would it be like for a Canadian young woman to join a caliphate? So if we could have detail about yeah, that, and you're the guy who knows it, um, and you know that people actually do do this and then, um, you know, freak out once they get there and want to get the hell out of there. I've read stories like this. So that's the part that I feel like I want a little bit more specificity. Yeah, I would say, and it starts off with the promise that this is going to be about Eric. I mean, that, that's the thing. When you, when you start right. a pitch, wherever you start, that builds up our expectation. And Eric, you know, he, we feel like he's going to be the star of this book. And we're investing in him, and we, you know, he, he's he's someone who, like, we we know this world kind of because we've seen it a lot. I've never seen the world of a woman inside of a caliphate. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, I think the the part about Eric and his world is not nearly as interesting to me as Ariel's journey and her world. I know. And what's going to happen when he shows up there to right. try and get her out? That's, that's where the thriller part of it yes, comes that's in. That's where we're going to be thrilled. So I would cut down Eric's part. We can get that pretty quickly. Get us to Ariel. Get us to the Caliphate. And I don't really know much about the relationship between a father and, and daughter either. That would be nice to, to right. see from the well, beginning. Well, clearly they're at odds with I, one Yeah, but another, you'd but like to see that, you know. If it's a long history of. If the pitch might start with, Dad, I don't care. I'm going. I have something to do. But, but, but you know, that might right. be the way to start this pitch where we see them butting heads. Or that she hasn't spoken to him in, in year, five years, years or whatever. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. The Weight of a Woman by J. Jackson Pomeroy. A professor's chronic dieting to get into her latest pair of designer jeans shreds her self image as a fervent feminist. The temptation of a taboo relationship with a hot new graduate student and her usual one too many drinks not only add to her angst, they put her job on the line and a lot more besides. If she doesn't connect, if she doesn't soon connect all her bad choices with the damage of a past sexual assault, her very well being is at stake. Set on a rural university campus where the experimental sex community begins to draw its first breath, my story blurs the lines of fiction and cultural criticism. A dark-humored, PhD-wielding Bridget Jones romping around the hunger essays of Roxanne Gay. Originally from the UK, I came to the US to earn my PhD. I'm a researcher at Wellesley College and the recipient of a writing award, which will appear in an international anthology of fiction this spring. I've been teaching women's studies slash fiction since 1998, and I am also published in my field. Having had both professional and personal experience with eating disorders and sexual assault, I believe I am uniquely qualified to write a survivor narrative. Very nice. So there's again there's so many interesting threads in this story, aren't yeah. there? Um, yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm a I'm a fan of the the. Um, the college professor with having problems, sort of genre. I, I like those kinds of books. Um, uh, I, th I think it's it really it it sucks you in, and it's it's got the. the um, I, I just like the fact that she's a fervent feminist who's also has this eating thing with the designer jeans. So immediately you set up this. We're always looking for conflict. But right from the first sentence, we see that this character is deeply conflicted, yeah. and it's great for for fiction. I think you set up character really, really well. Me too. I I I'm confused by the first sentence of the next line. It says set in a rural universe camp where the experimental sex community begins, but that's the first mention of it. I and you don't say anything more, so I don't know. I, didn't, I was confused, but I was interested. Totally interested. I'd like to go to school there. But I didn't quite understand what right. what era are we in? Me too. What, what, how are they experimenting with sexuality? Right. Is it a cult? Is it? It didn't. And then my story blurs the lines of fiction and cultural criticism. I I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't know how. You, are you just saying that thematically that you are dealing with themes of cultural criticism within the novel? 
or is there somehow cultural criticism part is that part of the book because I, I don't see Bridget Jones being cultural criticism, and I, I, I don't see um, Roxane Gay writing these kinds of stories. So it, it didn't quite... So you could say with the themes of Roxane Gay played out with the humor yeah, and be, style yeah, of Bridget Jones, that would make more sense to me. Because if it is an actual melding of, of um, cultural criticism and fiction, that is gonna be so very to difficult sell. to sell. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, but it's I and your bio is fabulous. Yeah, I was a little um, taken aback uh, by the you just sort of drop in past sexual assault, and it and it doesn't really manifest anywhere else in this. I mean, it feels like actually. Yeah, it does. Sorry, it's dropped into this pitch. Oh, I thought you meant in no, here, in, in the, story. the author's bio. No, in the story. I, I see think... how it plays out in the plot. It's mentioned once, it's almost throwaway in the middle of a sentence, but it doesn't seem to impact the rest of the story. I don't see right. how it Like, does. Is, does that have to do with experimental the experimental sex, sex community? community? So I think the second paragraph, I think, really needs to be blown up with more detail so that yeah. we understand how these things come to play out in the actual plot of the book. And if you're gonna put the sexual assault in there, we have to see how it's gonna manifest in this story in some way, how it's gonna affect her. Casey's Star by Mike Drew. Casey was certain she found exactly what she was looking for when she arrived on her star so long ago. Time has passed though, and she begins feeling that maybe this isn't where she truly belongs. As Casey's star begins to dim, she's given the chance to see and travel through the galaxy, peer into amazing new worlds and potentially a new place to call home. So just from a word count point of view, I would say that this is about 50 to 75 yes, words. Yes, and you have 250. And you have 250. So this goes more into what we would call an elevator pitch, which we call because you have That's to fit, but it isn't really. No, it's not really. So th this is a little bit of a no man's land in terms of the the how much we are told. Right. And so while we get, we do get a sense of plot here, absolutely, of what happens, but we don't know character, we don't have much world building, and we don't know the arc of the story in any kind of real detail. Yeah, if I'm an agent or, or, or I'm um, an editor, or if I'm a reader, I don't know what I'm buying here exactly. I don't see how the twists and turns of a plot are not present here. And there's not enough specificity. There's too much generality. Um, she was, Casey was certain she found exactly what she was looking for. But what was she looking for exactly? And what is her star? I don't know what that is or what that means, what it looks like. Uh, is she human? Can she breathe? Well, I, I, I don't quite um, get placed, there's not specifically in a spot in the universe. I don't see what she looks like. So when we talk about pitch, we generally mean what you see on the back of like a paperback book or the flaps of a hardcover, right, right, right. Um, which we say is approximately 250 words. Right. And, and the reason, um, you know, that there's that many words is because it's, really hard in 75 words to get a sense of character specificity and plot and arc yeah. all at once. So there's, there's, this is a great, you know, skeleton yeah, beginning for of your story. pitch, yeah. but the next draft is about filling this out right. with particulars. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Anything else you want to say? I think that's it. Okay. Um, the Library of Unspoken Things by Lucy Hallowell. 17-year-old Charlotte Fairfax has spent the past two months listening to her conservative father give campaign speeches. While he spewed rhetoric about traditional, quote unquote, traditional values and quote, the good old days, she planned a very different kind of speech, coming out to the roommate she's been in love with since freshman year. Mm -hmm. 
The night before she's due to return to Holmes Academy for senior year, Charlotte finds solace in her favorite queer novel, psyching herself up to come out to her roommate. But when her father interrupts and realizes what she's reading and what it means about Charlotte herself, he forbids her from coming out, ever. If she does, he'll send her away somewhere far enough that she can't hurt his campaign for Senate or see her roommate again. Afraid to lose her best friend, Charlotte agrees to stay in the closet. But when all the queer books disappear from the school library, including the one her father caught her reading, Charlotte refuses to remain a silent prop any longer. With the help of her roommate, who Charlotte is half convinced might be flirting with her, Charlotte launches an underground mm, library. Fun. And maybe, just maybe, she'll find the courage to put her true self on the shelves too. The Library of Unspoken Things is a complete YA novel at 78,000 words. It's moxie with a lesbian romance at its heart. And I just want to say that I started to tear up oh, at the end. Oh, look at that. You. So, wow, yeah. you got my wife <laughs> with the lesbian love story. <laughs> I love it. Uh, this is... It's so... Uh, it, it was moving. It was really moving. moving. And, and, and it... It takes this uh, this idea of you know longing for forbidden love that's been the subject of so many different stories and has a really nice twist on it. Again, it's familiar and yet it's unique. And I love the father with the senatorial yeah, campaign. Yeah, it seems so uh, current and modern. And the and title is beautiful. Title is so I beautiful. love the library of unspoken things. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen uh, the Good Wife about a wife who has to stand next to her. Um, politician husband and the effect that this has on the kids. So I feel like this is in the cultural zeitgeist. Uh, I think Moxie is a great comp and you it makes me feel like you know your YA literature. So that, that was terrific. The one thing, when you say afraid to lose her best friend, I didn't know that this was her best friend. I thought the roommate was just the person she had a crush on. So that wasn't established, and it, I thought maybe you were talking about someone else when that paragraph started. Well, it says here, uh, coming out to the roommate, she's, she's been, been in, in love, love with, with since. but that's different than her best friend. Uh huh. Yeah, it is. It is. Different. So yeah. that was the one thing that uh -huh. I thought was uh -huh. a, a a little world a weird. I loved the 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 words "silent prop." I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Silent Prop is great, yeah. Um, and the library, the underground library. And the underground library is such a cool idea. So what I think could add to this pitch and make it better is what are the consequences? The, what's the worst case right. scenario if everything doesn't work out? Is she going to be sent to some conversion camp? Right. I mean, that would be... Absolutely. Like a great way for this, this thing... To end, like she's almost sent off and then something has to happen at the end where she saves herself or maybe her roommate saves her. But I, I didn't quite get that. I'm not hanging by my fingers. Yeah, how sinister quite. is her father? Right. What, he what seems is pretty it? sinister. Right. Yeah. So that I think that's a great tip. Like what's what, what could happen? Okay. Cookie Rookie <laughs> by Victoria Beck. Middle grade novel. With more at stake than a gold medal and against her mother, mother's wishes, 12-year-old Eloise Hansen risks everything to enter a baking competition. Her mother is baffled and annoyed by her baking obsession and wonders why her daughter isn't more like her. When her mother makes plans for a fancy weekend getaway for Eloise to meet her new boyfriend on the same day as the competition, Eloise must find a way to sneak out of the festivities and keep her nerves together to bake her traditional championship Cranberry cutie. With the help of her savvy best friend who concocts a plan that will get her out of the nightmare, starring her as the darling, dutiful daughter, and propel her backstage with 12 grown up finalists. One of the contestants has swapped recipes and ingredients with Eloise, hoping the rookie will crumble and he'll emerge victorious. He hadn't counted on the power of her dad's lucky red socks and Eloise's newfound strength as a capital B baker. In front of the entire seventh grade, her mother in the city of Santa Barbara, Eloise pits her baking know-how and the classic goodness of a straight-up chocolate chip cookie against the experience and determination of the best bakers in California. 
So our do- our ten year old daughter is a major she's baker. So this is the, the kind of thing that she would love. Oh, and she watches all the baking shows and the competitions and everything. So, so one yes. picky tiny thing, but that's really important. It says uh, when her mother makes plans for a fancy weekend getaway for Eloise to meet. Her new boyfriend. boyfriend. It sounds like that's it's Eloise's refer- boyfriend. It is from a grammatical perspective. Yes. That's yes. referring to Eloise to meet her mother's new boyfriend. So, the reason I'm bringing this up is it stopped me. It I had did. to think, and I'm out of the pitch and, when I have to you do know, that. Agents and 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 publishers, they're looking for a reason to say no, and sometimes just that will be the reason to say no. The next point of confusion is that if she's away on this weekend. How is she able to go? The baking competition happens to be where her mother is taking her. That yeah, also confusing. stopped me. So that yeah. has to be established. But other than that, I love this idea of this 12 year old girl yeah. among all these adults and a horrible adult who's, who's trying, is trying to, to take her recipe from her. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, our kid watches all of these baking shows yes, and it has like the, there, you can just see sort of the, the reality yeah, element so of totally. this in, yeah. in, and there's, there's just really good, funny um, stuff. Like he hadn't counted on the power of dad's lucky red socks. I just yeah. love that kind of detail. Yeah. 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 Really a fun story. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Iron and Lace by Ellie Tupper. In 1890s San Francisco, a spirited young Irish housemaid and an imperial Chinese agent joined forces to bring down a ruthless tycoon. Feisty Nora Horrigan has taken a position as housemaid in the home of Hector Gaffney, businessman and and railroad magnate, whom she suspects of being involved in the disappearance of Nora's brother, Angus, With her ma'am's ancestral skills of knotting magic, Nora creates lacy textiles that can soothe or sicken, reveal secrets, or protect a man's life. Meanwhile, in Canton, China, merchant seaman Stephen Rollison rescues a Pinkerton investigator from a Chinese gang with the aid of Zhu Faiming, an agent of the Imperial Court who is pursuing the same criminals. Someone is shipping hopeful Chinese immigrants to America, then selling them as slaves and prostitutes, including Zhu's own brother and his crippled wife. Nora's and Stephen, Nora and Stephen and Zhu's separate searches converge in San Francisco's bustling, mysterious Chinatown and find their common focus on Hector Gaffney. Opium smuggling, a massive railroad swindle, Gaffney's unhappy wife and son, kidnapping and white slavery, tangle in a terrifying knot that not even Nora Spells may be able to unravel. Iron and Lace is a YA novel of of history and magic with glimpses into Victorian household management, life in the Chinese railroad labor camps, and the dangerous secrets of underground San Francisco. My stories have been published in Mind Flights, Everyday Fiction, Andromeda Spaceways Magazine, and Esther Freisner's Which Way to the Mall. Again, such a cool story. Um, I'm uh, watching a show called The Alienist right now, which is based on a novel about the 1890s in New York. Mm. Uh, And um, you just think there's a big market for this kind of story. Um, And... I love the, the feisty character, the yeah. Irish uh, woman at the center of it, and the lacy textiles. Yeah. That's so cool. And I love how you bring yeah, back the, knot, the word knot at the end. Really, it's very skillful. Very skillful. Very skillfully done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because you have a lot of characters, yes. it doesn't allow you to move the plot very far forward. Right. But... I think you do a really good job because you establish them, what's going on, and then put them in Chinatown in San Francisco. Because you have two very different worlds here. You got the world of of the the Irish uh, housemaid and then Canton, uh, China. Then we get to this list, and certain things on the list work for me and certain things don't. Opium smuggling, thumbs up. A massive railroad swindle, thumbs up. Gaffney's unhappy wife and son, thumbs down. I don't. Right. I don't have context for it. It's kind of boring. No. Kidnapping and white slavery, good. Tang. So it's really just the Gaffney's unhappy right. wife and Take son. Yeah. Um, so 
The last thing is we get to a YA novel. Why? How is That's this what YA? I thought too. There's so many adult themes. I don't this. think is there is Nora a young Irish housemaid, but we don't know. Is she 16 years old? Right. Or is she 20? So if she's 16 or 17, that's fine. But Stephen Rollison and Ju Feiming, I don't think those are adults. Yeah, I can't be a, a kid. And it's Pinkerton very hard to have a YA novel where you're sharing the stage with two adults from a sales perspective. And also, you know, s sex slaves and prostitutes, that's a tough sell. Right now, the um, YA market, it's, the, the publishers are very, very cautious and very leery of, of, of buying anything that is uh, racy. And, um, you know, this subject matter is, is so adult, it well, feels like. Th there, there's a certain kind of way, YA novel that does have sex in it but this is a historical novel that you would want librarians and teachers to recommend so it's a weird mashup i don't know how much you have about sex sexual slavery or what have you but in general it seems to me that i'm not quite sure this is a ya novel yeah I'm, i agree I, it's but it's a fantastic story i think that absolutely yeah. um, could do well in the marketplace no question God's Blood, Book One of the Shatter Spire Symphony by Daniel T. Moore. The gods are dead. Change is coming on wings, heralded by three women. The girl of fire and sunshine will become the ache in the heart of the world, will weep a trail of tears which burst into blooms of flame for a sister that could not be saved, will hunt through the streets of a shadowed city for a father and a brother to save one and kill the other, will stand on a grave marked with no stone and look out on a world of her own making. But she is young yet. The surgeon of Artisan's Alley, whose criminal enterprise is built for the triumph of the poor over the tyranny of the rich, who breaks the knees of nobles unable to meet the terms of their loans and turns over the profits to the sick and the poor, who, for love, will find herself elsewhere entirely. The gunslinger is the restless daughter of a man murdered by his best friend, a woman out of love with her life, out of love with her man, and on a collision course with those who put her father in an early grave. God's Blood is a 140,000 plus word PG-13 story that won't stand still. It's an epic sci-fi fantasy about three young black women ages nine, 27, and 34. So there's, there's many um, very current themes at work. Change is coming on wings heralded by three women. women. Black women, no less. Exactly. Um, and uh, the, poor, uh, the, the poor over the tyranny of the rich, like those are themes that I think people are hungry yeah, for I agree. right now. And there's some beautiful writing in it too, isn't there? It's very lyrical. Very lyrical writing. Gorgeous. So my number one question, this book is by Daniel T. Moore. So, oh, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Um, it's a man, um, you know, writing about women's power, which could be fine. Yeah. But I don't know, Daniel, if you are white or black Person or what. Uh, yep. And right now, the the publishing industry is just not tolerant terrified of of people writing from especially white people writing about people of color from um without being one cultural appropriation they're going after bruno mars for god's sake bruno mars so i gotta be very careful so that. that that is a big big question and mark let's be clear me. i I speak for myself. I don't have a problem with someone writing about someone who isn't like themselves. But this, what Ariel is saying, is a fact of publishing but, right now. But let's talk about where it comes from, which is oh no, like, there's no question. If it's, that yes. It comes from a place of first of all, very few books by people of color being published, books about people of color being published, and often 
that when they are published, they're written by white people and don't reflect the realities of yes. those people. And those, yes. So, yeah. so there, there is a real reason for it. There, there might be too much of a sensitivity right now. Only history will be able to tell us that. But I'm telling you from a sales point of yes. view that it is an issue. Yes, it is. Um, now, the second issue that I have is I, I don't understand. I don't get a plot. I don't get a whiff of a plot. I don't get a story here. I get some fantastic characters. I get a cool world, uh, kind of, that uh, we're going to inhabit. But how do these characters relate to each other? What are they trying to achieve? How? What are the series of actions that make up a plot, that build, that have switcheroos in them, that are have places that we're not expecting to go that that build to a you know fiery climax I, I don't get any literally any of that in this pitch um it seems clear that this person is a fantastic writer of amazing sentences and building cool characters but again if i'm a publisher i'm an agent i, I need to know what the plot is more before i would take something like this on and spend you know years of my life working on it okay and now for our last pitch oh of the evening. Wow, really? Okay. Landslide by Emma Burns. The summer after high school graduation has ended and all of Anna Marie's friends have gone off to college, leaving her staring down a bleak future in her tiny Maine ski town, driving Appalachian Trail hikers to and from town and living under the thumb of her paranoid mama. When Anna, when Anna Marie decides to take control of her life at last, she finds the daredevil snowboarder father she has always been told was dead. Unraveling the mystery of her family's past opens up a whole world to Anna Marie and leads her to make choices about her future that change her and her family forever. Landslide is an 81,000 word young adult novel set in contemporary rural Maine where the past is everywhere and the modern world sits uncomfortable nearby, where backwoods backpackers walk through town like ghosts and wealthy outsiders swoop in to ski and party, both groups tended by locals who are barely scraping by. The tensions between these groups drive the novel, as does the moment when every young person must decide which of the many worlds to choose. I've always loved these stories about the uh, little communities that are yeah. run by the people who work there yeah. and they're scuffling by and, and all the rich party bars that come in and like spending the money and they're all entitled and ordering everybody around with the little noses up in the air. That, 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 who doesn't love a story like that? Yeah. So I'm right with you there. Uh, and this poor kid, I just, <laughs> I, you created a good character. I feel a lot of sympathy for Anna Marie already in just this one paragraph. So what's interesting to me is I love the second paragraph which describes yeah, 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 the, the first world. paragraph yeah. had a lot of cliches yes, to me. and generalities. Generalities. Yes. So staring down a bleak future, um, take control of her life. Mystery of her family's past. Mystery of her family. Make choices about her future that change her and her family forever. That could describe a million stories. Whereas right? the writing in the second paragraph is fantastic. Very specific. It's so specific. Yeah. So. What I would do is I would put some of this message yeah, into the walk her through yeah. or have her wait on these people or whatever she's doing so that we can see it rather than you telling us it in the first paragraph. Yeah, yeah. Great title. Yeah, that's a wonder. Really and great. I think the setting could really help you sell this book. That really could. It's the the it it it, it really it also gets to a larger societal issue yeah, right does, now of right. people scraping by in the very Versus rich. one percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, is there a is there a love thing that goes on in here? Uh, if there is, there it should be in the pitch. Uh, if there's I don't not, see that. Anywhere. I mean, it's really about the father. She's yeah, a, she you her, know, so she and her, she and her dad, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I just I, I guess I feel that that whatever that main conflict is between her and another person needs, needs to be developed more yes, so that we see that it comes to some kind of, we see some twists and some um, wrangling between them and, and it comes to some sort of dangerous high stakes ending. Yep. So as oh, I, by the way, one last thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, we are dying to come to Maine to mm. do a pitch of Palooza. It's one of the four states I've never been to. So. Okay. 
Um, while David marks which oh, yeah. pitch he thinks should be the winner, I'm going to answer some questions okay. that have come up during the pitch palooza. Okay. So let me get up these questions. First one, can you use quotes? Of course you can use quotes. Sure. In fact, someone used an Oscar Wilde quote to great success in their pitch earlier. Mm -hmm. Start with an excerpt. Yes, in fact, that can help give a sense of voice right away uh, when using an excerpt. For anyone who wants to write a picture book, that's particularly import important to have a sense of what the picture book is gonna sound like. Um, do you think that character names can lessen your chances of finding an agent? My main character has a distinctly Jewish name, and I have family that suggested that's why I haven't had any luck. Well, if Jewish themes are part of your book, then I don't think it's a problem at all. If you're writing a contemporary thriller, maybe, but I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's an issue. Um, to me, the place where I see names being an issue is mostly in sci-fi and fantasy right. where people use the same kind Mahalafa of Nuta. made up names that all sound like they've been used before, even though the, the, clearly the intention is to be original. Okay. Um, uh, so... Upmarket, I think the question in here is upmarket fiction would be like Hunger Games and literary would be like blank. I haven't read a purely literary book in a while. No, upmarket fiction, Hunger Games is commercial fiction, yes, pure and literary. simple. No. Up, upmarket fiction are, you know, the prize winning books that you see. Donna Tart. Yes, good example. What was that one that she, that, that she just had out that was so fantastic? Um, it just it was like two years ago, it did all kinds it of Jeffrey the bird on the cover. Yeah, Goldfinch. 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 Yeah. That is a piece of literary and yet commercial fiction, upscale fiction. Um, a piece of purely literary fiction might be uh, David Foster Wallace, mm -hmm. who writes these really dense, thick, poetic. I mean, it's, you know, it's half a step from James Joyce, actually. Um, okay. Is new adult harder to sell because it's not as popular or hard to sell because it's a newer genre? I think it's because it's a newer genre. I mean, this whole- And because it's not, because it's a newer genre, it's not as popular because it hasn't, hasn't had as much time to establish yeah, sure, itself. Sure. I mean, this whole mania we have with categorization of books, there's a reason for it. I mean, we need to know where the romances are and the thrillers are, but I, I feel like you know the distinction between a young adult novel and a new adult novel seems so ridiculous to me. But you know, this is the jungle in which we travel. Um, does anyone know how many curse words are allowed in YA? Four, four curse words. Yeah, that's it. No, I'm I'm being facetious. Um, generally speaking, if you have a YA novel and it's going to be taught in schools. And in libraries, you don't want any cursing in there. But if you don't care if your book gets read in libraries and schools, have as much cursing as you want. I mean, teenagers swear all the time, but it, it will restrict uh, your audience. There's some publishers who just won't buy a YA book if it has if they have if it has a lot of swearing. Um, Are you making sure that you're reading the next one? No, I'm reading. Okay, the next one. just. But. Okay, so if your character is older than 18, it's no longer YA, even if you're writing it for teens. Ha, huh, this is a great question. That's a good and question. And a frustrating one. It is. Your character can be older, but you make it much harder to sell. It is. Um, Again, it seems so ridiculous. It does me, seem ridiculous, but I, it, it just, it, it presents a barrier. It does. It's not impossible, no. but but that that can happen. Okay, when doing a pitch and your novel is in first person, should your pitch also be in first person? This is a case where you can use a little, a little bit excerpt. of the book excerpt at the top to give a sense of the first person, but then move into third person. Yeah, yeah, because we get these pitches that are all first person and it just doesn't feel like a pitch. Um, is a bio necessary in a pitch? These folks all have really interesting and relevant things to say about themselves, but nothing in my personal life has anything 
to do with my book. Yeah, you do need a bio. We need to know who you are. And sometimes the thing that's great about you is has nothing to do with your book. Like uh, Ariel, a client uh, as an agent who was an Olympic bobsledder. And she was writing a novel about Africa. Nothing to do with Bob. Zero. However, when you read in a bio that someone is an Olympic bobsledder, it just, you know certain things about them. They're disciplined. They're going to show up every day. They're going to be enormously driven and ambitious. You don't get to be an Olympic bobsledder unless you have some game. Or let's say you're a librarian. Like right. that love automatically yes, gives you positive um uh, uh, vibes for anyone reading your pitch. Yeah, we, we were at a pitch blues and someone said, I they had said this exact question. I don't know what to say for my bio. We said, well, what do you, what do you do? I don't do anything. Well, what have you been doing for the last 15 years? Nothing. I haven't done anything. Well, you must've done something. She says, no, I have 13 kids and I just haven't done a thing. 13 kids. If you can give birth and run a household that has 13 kids, probably going to do pretty well in publishing. Most people think that their bio sucks. Yes. It's and true. it's really helpful to have your number one cheerleader help yeah, you write your is. bio so they can tell you what's interesting about you. I mean, maybe you collect birds nests and you have 500 birds nests of all different varieties. I mean, there's so many things that you might think, "Oh, no one's going to care about this because of my book." But it will it will make a big difference. By the way, in our book, The Essential Guide to Getting Your Book Published, there's a long section about bios. I think we did a movie, a YouTube movie about that too, didn't we? I think we did. About the bio? Yeah. Because it's tricky if you haven't published something, you know, and, and most people don't really know how to value themselves highly or they value themselves too much. Okay, someone wants to know how to set your fantasy pitch apart from all of them. And this is the question that's for good, me. That's a good question. I am not a fantasy no, and sci-fi reader. No. Personally, in my personal reading time, right. but I read tons of fantasy and sci-fi pitches and and manuscripts. Yeah. And to me, it is very rare to see a pitch that I think stands apart from the rest. And it has to do with this issue of specificity and theme. So I want to see a right. theme that right. resonates with our world today. Right. Why do we care about this made up world unless it reflects something in our world? And so many times I did, that all the pitches are a galaxy where the the everything has gone bad and you have to save the day. And, and a beautiful the, princess. And a beautiful know she's a princess. princess discovers she has powers and she has to fight against the forces of evil to save the galaxy. Exactly. We get like, I would say 87% of the fantasy sci-fi pitches we get have that exact same theme in them. So, you know, for great science fiction and fantasy shows us human nature in a way we haven't quite seen it before. It illuminates the human condition in a new and fascinating way. And that's your job when you pitch a science fiction or fantasy novel. So we're just gonna take a couple more questions, but one of them is an important one here. What happens to all the pitches that didn't make it up oh. here? <laughs> so um, obviously we would be here for days yes, if we, we were reading all the 600 pitches. 600 pitches. That's why we only picked 20. However, uh, Anyone who buys a copy of our book, The Essential right, Guide to Getting Your Book Published, right. which has all the kinds of information we've been talking about tonight and so much more, um, if you buy a copy, you get to take part in a free webinar where you get to pitch. We, we will read your pitch live in the webinar and critique it just like we did with all the others well. here. So if you email the address that you emailed to us earlier, then we will set you up with a webinar and your pitch will be heard. Um, and we hope we hope people will do that. Not just, of course, we would love the book sales, but it's, as you can see, helpful to have your pitch broken down. Um, is realistic fiction considered to be a genre or would it be better to use the title contemporary? Contemporary, yeah. yeah? Um, should you include your ending in your pitch or do you leave it hanging? Cliffhanger, baby. We don't want to know the butler did it. Don't tell us the butler killed the guy in the parlor with the wrench. Yeah. We don't want to know that. 
leave us hanging. Okay, so last question, okay. how long should your elevator pitch be? Okay, here's our elevator pitch for our book. The what to expect when you're expecting a, a publishing. publishing. The what to expect when you're expecting of publishing. Nine words and about six seconds. About six seconds, yeah. So it literally has to be as long as it takes to get to the next floor of the elevator. The catcher in the catcher in the rye with Asperger's. Okay, now before you get to the final an and I pitch. final stuff and I choose the winner here mm -hmm. based on your thing, should we do the pitch for our book so that people oh, can yeah. see? This is what so, a pitch is. So you can see what a professional pitch looks like. We are now going to give the pitch for our book. Okay. The, the essential, essential guide, guide to getting, getting your book published is a step-by-step, step, blow-by-blow explanation, explanation of how to take an idea you're passionate about, make a book out of it, get it published, and deliver it into the hands, heads, and hearts of readers all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 19 seconds, 19 people. But it seconds. took us six months to write. Memorize and choreograph. You couldn't get the full effect of the choreography here, but it's quite stunning. All right, so everybody, um, the Rymos, keep up with the Camp Nano Rymo. It's happening in April. Get this book done, get it edited, get a bunch of people to read it, get it ready to go out. Um, the fan favorite voting is live. Head over to our website, www.thebookdoctors.com to vote. The voting closes on April Fool's Day. Don't be a fool. Vote early and vote often. No, don't vote often. Just kidding. Just vote early. Uh, the winner will be announced on April 2nd. Um, if you'd like any information on publishing or writing, opportunities to pitch, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a, a website, as we mentioned. And, and we have a newsletter. a newsletter that we send out not too regularly, don't worry, but yeah, it yeah. has <laughs> all kinds of free advice on getting your book published as well as helpful articles um, and other information that you might find helpful on your publishing journey. For instance, journal. anyone in New Jersey, journey. we're going to be doing Pitch of Palooza's in New Jersey. We're going to be doing one this Saturday. Uh, what day is that? I don't know. This coming Saturday. And we're going to Hawaii in November. Yeah, Hawaii. Check Come it join out. us in Hawaii. Oh my God. Okay. I'm so excited. I'm borrowing David for five seconds because I have narrowed it down to two choices. Oh my God. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I'd go with either one of them. It's so know. hard. It's very hard. We're deciding someone's future, whether their <laughs> dreams will come true or not, right now. And it's very, very stressful. I'm getting a little agita. It's either heartburn or a heart attack or an aneurysm. I don't know which. Um, I don't know, man. I can see both of them. Either one. Just pick one. Okay. Are you going with that one? I think you should do the other one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, people. Here it is. The winner of tonight's Pitchapalooza is Mary Jo Talbot with Woo! watching Wilhelmina. Congratulations, Mary Jo. This was the pitch about the kid who's homeschooled because she has with diabetes dog, and dog, she has to train the, the dog. dog. Yeah. yeah. So but there were so many great ones. Congratulations to, to everyone. Everybody. Whether you got whether you even heard your pitch read or not, we hope you got something out of this. Please continue to ask us questions, whether you email us or the comment. The book doctors, we are dedicated to helping every one of you, every one of you, <laughs> get successfully published. That's our goal. So if you need help, you need advice, you need a hookup, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, everybody. See Have you at a the great bookstore. night. See, See you at the, the bookstore. bookstore. Bye.